Will you read the scripture with me on the back of the bulletin? The passage is from Ephesians 1. It's a rare, a little bit long, but uh, important. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now read that paragraph with me out loud. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Will you take just a teaching moment? Notice, in love he predestined us. If every time you see that in Scripture, you substituted the word purposed, he pre-purposed us, you'd have an alternate reading, which is very much contained in the original understanding because God chose us, but until we choose back, it's not a completed transaction, see? It's kind of neat if you look on the front of the bulletin, it says he destined us for adoption as, chil as his children. We'll talk about that a little bit more too, but I like that a word destined or pre-purposed us. Let me read the next paragraph and join me for the last one, if you will. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ, see, to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth under one head, even Christ. In him we are also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Bless your heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And let's pray for just a moment, please. Holy Spirit of God, we ask now that you might come and join us as the word is offered in the vessel of preaching. Help us to understand that you yourself sometimes in wonderful moments occupy preaching and we say, praise God. In Jesus' name, amen about 3,000 miles or so. It was kind of a drive. It's what we wanted to do, and we enjoyed it. We honestly did get to Memphis and flip a coin. Uh, tails, we go west. Heads, we go east, and uh, we went west. And uh, anyway, one night, we were in a little town somewhere in uh, Mexico, uh, New Mexico, and I went to the grocery store to pick up a couple of things that we wanted. And a group of kids were standing around over near the cash register. There were very few people in the store, and so these were some of the employees standing over there. Um, and the one guy was saying to the girl, hey, where's the party tonight, honey? And the other guy said, yeah, where's the party, man? And they all got together, and they were just talking back and forth. Isn't it interesting that we're looking for the party, that we need to party, that whatever party means to us, somehow it represents a value. It represents a kind of a celebration, something that is important to people. I also had an opportunity of counseling uh, a couple of weeks ago with a person that I have a lot of respect for who moves in a pretty formal uh, class um, of folks, whatever that means, you know, and is very busy with a lot of things. And uh, after we had done our counseling and all the way out, uh, as we always stand and make sure that everybody gets to their car safely before they leave, um, she stopped and she said, you know, I wrote this down because I wanted to get it right. I'm completely exhausted in the pursuit of pleasure. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been there and done that, but I'll tell you, you can get there. Having to party, uh, needing to do it. Now, what's curious about this passage that we have just shared together is that Paul has written it for our good. Paul has written it for the good of generations to come. Not only his time and the time to follow, our time and the time to come. He is celebrating his place in existence. And where is he? In jail. Where is he most of the time? In prison. Why? Because he continues to do what it is he feels God has called him to do. He continues to become the person that he believes God is calling him to become. And so what he has discovered is the kingdom party. 
the real celebration, the kind of experience that causes us to celebrate anyway, or to celebrate no matter what. And that's no small thing. That's a pretty significant gift. And so as we talk about the party, first of all, let me suggest to you that our celebration should run deeper than the frivolities that we often call party. Our celebration is based on the fact that we have been given grace and some of us have cho chosen to receive it. When I go to churches from time to time and have a chance to preach as I am invited to be a small part of the ministry of that church, I always feel almost um, called to say, have you had your experience of grace? Have you had your share of the grace of God? You know why? Because church people talk grace more and experience grace less than just about anybody. Now, that's not because we're worse. It's because we are subject to the opportunity. Don't you see? Not everybody knows that grace exists. Not everybody knows that God can love you in your present condition, in your present understanding, in your present place, in your present life. And to know that you are loved Greatly loved by God is the greatest gift of all, and it's the cause for the biggest celebration. Some of you all know that I played music for a long time. Um, I played with a little band called the Southerners, and I was a drummer. And as some of you will remember, my dad said the only thing I couldn't do as a drummer was keep the beat. But other than that, I was pretty good. <laughs> and, um, but we'd go to a lot of these parties and all. And every now and then when we'd take a, a, a gig, they'd play music, and some of us would dance. And I'd get out there and dance, and... Uh, I just have a good time. And this girl came up and said, what are you drinking? And uh, I said, what? And she said, what are you drinking? And I said, Coke. She said, you couldn't possibly be drinking a Coca-Cola uh, and having that much fun. And I said, why not? And she said, you just couldn't. She said, you got to get drunk. you got to get high to really have a party. Isn't that interesting? Well, I was high, but I wasn't drunk. Or maybe another way to put it, the book puts it like this. They were drunk on the spirit. Remember? Remember what Paul said? Somebody help me. Said it was only 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I don't know why I think that's funny. You didn't think it was funny, did you? <laughs> but anyway, 9 o'clock in the morning, you know. Um, being able to dance in the Spirit. Remember David, you know, when the Ark of the Covenant and God's presence. Is, man, I mean, he put on a dance that we have remembered, uh, particularly that girl that looked out the window and saw that he wasn't uh, well-dressed. Um, well, we won't go into that anyway. But, you know, what he did, you know what he did? He abandoned everything in the fullness of the celebration and the fullness of the joy. That's really great. And not only that, you know, God works in the strangest doggone ways. Our, all of our celebrations should run far deeper and have greater meaning than sometimes we ascribe to them. Um, I'm dancing at Wells Fest. I happened to be dancing with one of our girls that time and having a good time. Um, you see, I was raised in that part of the church where Christians do not dance. So I didn't even think I was one for a long time, you know, because, boy, I just danced, you know. I mean, a Cajun who don't dance, I mean, that would really be bad, would it, you know, you know. Uh, what I really wanted to sing for them was the old song when they would tell me that Christians do not dance. I wanted to sing my old song that I learned as a child, uh, Cajun. You got the right string, Daddy, but the wrong yo-yo. <laughs> anyway, I'm dancing away, and this girl comes up after it's over, and she's in tears. And I say, you okay, honey? And she said, if my daddy had ever danced with me, my world would have been different. You think you can't dance to the glory of God? You think you can't dance the celebration of the grace of God given for you and for me? You can. The second thing is that our relationships run deeper. We can celebrate because our relationships run deeper. What does it say? That we were pre-purposed to be the sons and daughters of God. That God wants a relationship with us in such a way that God will do whatever is necessary, that God will speak to us, that God will embrace us, that God will offer God's self to us just so that we can find our place in the order of things, to find that we are the legitimate sons and daughters of God by adoption. That's the way we all come to God. Destined, purposed, intentionally brought into the kingdom of God, but not forced in, not hit over the head and said, you will be my son and you will be my daughter. But rather, whosoever will, let him let her come. Sometimes people said, what is the mission of Wells Church? You know, what is your mission statement? You ever worked on one of those? Uh, sometimes you can spend a lot of time. We spent a lot of time. We had a professional consultant. We spent a lot of time. And we worked on something. It was two or three. I can't even remember what it was, but it was a paragraph or two. We finally had to reduce it to that. And one of the ladies in the church from the neighborhood said, 
uh, honey, your mission is written on a sign. <laughs> Loving, caring, sharing. She said, either you do it or you don't. She said, put up or shut up. That pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? You know? And what better, what better word could there be for church? Loving, caring, sharing. Okay, here's where it gets a little raunchy. Loving, caring, sharing who? The whosoever is that walk in that door. The people that groove with us and like what we do and the people that don't groove with us and may not like what we do, we have some of those. The people who feel at home here and the people who feel like they're strangers and aliens and don't have a place anywhere. I have seen some of you who used to be some of those and some of you who are now heads of the family. Heads of the household of this particular part of the church of God. A sense of deep belonging. And let me tell you how Wells Church exists by your invitation. This crazy, broken, wounded, healthy, wonderful, being healed group of men and women and children exists solely by your invitation and the hospitality you extend to people when they walk in the door. Sociologically, we can't exist. We've had any number of people have come and say, in this location, at this time, under these conditions, with those people. <laughs> what the devil does that mean? You mean this wonderful group of people here? Is that what they mean? You know? And what that means is some of us very far along in the faith, some of us not even started yet, some of us turned off, some of us at least willing to give it a half of a chance, some of us broken, some of us being put that together again. Thank God for us. And that we sense that we belong to a family much larger than our own. That's why I don't mind saying in the creed, the Holy Catholic Church. Because I happen to believe with all my heart that we are a part of God's church, but not the only part. But just as much a part, and just as true a part, and just as true a church, and just as New Testament a church, and just as Christ-like a church as anybody. Anywhere. Period. <laughs> Excuse me. That's a soapbox. <laughs> uh, but I think it's so necessary for us to have a sense of that deep belonging that's ours. The other thing is we're being saved and being healed all the time. Did you see that, how the scripture says, you know, by the forgiveness of sins, uh, being saved? It's interesting because that word being saved in the scripture is a continuing thing. It's not just an event. Uh, it's a continuing experience. And, you know, how many of you are in exactly the same place as you were when you first became a Christian now? And if you are, you might want to look at that. Um, every now and then I used to have a testimony meeting in a church that I served. Uh, you know what a testimony meeting is? Some of you all too young to even remember. Anyway, you'd say, does anybody want to give that testimony? And these people would get up, and it was always the same people. And they would say, 27 years ago when Jesus came into my heart. Well, I mean, that's great. And I mean, there's anything wrong with that. But you know what I did one day? I really got risky. I said, after this guy got through, I said, what the Lord done for you in the last 12 hours, the last 10 hours? He said, huh. And he said, am. You know, and I was close enough to him that he knew I wasn't trying to get on his case, uh, make light of it. But what I'm saying to you is when you're talking about being saved, being healed, what is God doing, you know, now? I'm coming in this morning, and um, I'm still a little tired. Uh, we had a good day. We, you know, we got in late, and we had that wedding. Yes, it was a big wedding, and a lot of things were going on, and some of our people were sick, and I was trying to be in touch with them and get caught up with that and do some pastoral stuff. Then I had to clean the church physically. That's why I want some of you to help. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and I don't mind. I don't mind that. I intend to do my part. But, you know, I wanted to look, look, look as nice as it could for the wedding and all. We only have a very part-time, part-time janitorial staff um, and all kinds of stuff. So this morning I got up, and I'm just real tired. And I'm on my way in. I said, you know, I'm supposed to be refreshed. We've been on vacation, you know, and all this kind of stuff. But I'm real tired. And so I said, okay, God, help me. I said, help me. I'm just driving along now in my little Accord coming here and in one Accord and uh, on my way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, on my way in. And here's my conversation with the Lord. Now, I don't have these talks like some preachers, you know, where the Lord talks. But here's what was going on in my inner person kind of impression. Well, you could say good morning. I said, excuse me, I forgot to do that. Morning, Lord. <laughs> and I said, got anything else to say? Nothing. Just quiet, just silent. And I said, why don't you give me a sign of some kind? I, you know, there are people that like the signs and wonder stuff and all. I don't get a lot of that. Why don't you give me a sign of some kind? Um, nothing. So I said, see? And uh, so then all of a sudden my inside said, well, just look. So I looked up and there's a magnolia tree. I passed this magnolia tree. How many years have we been living there, honey? 27 years. I've been passing that magnolia tree for 27 years. And all of a sudden I looked at it. And it had these little buds. It wasn't flowers. 
some kind of little brown buds on the ends of the leaves. And they were, they, they, that little bud, one of them kind of opened his mouth and he said, I'm getting ready to be a flower. <laughs> Later on, pretty soon, it's going to happen pretty soon. You know, I don't mean to say I really heard that. But, you know, all of a sudden this began to happen in my inside place. And, you know, what happens to us is so many times we don't see those moments of God. For example, our choir sings. Um, to me, it's a beautiful thing to be a part of a church where we can mix traditional worship values together with contemporary ones, uh, grand songs together with gospel songs, soul music together with uh, rap. For every now and then, we have to rap, you know. You got the right string did, but the wrong yo-yo. Mm, yeah, you know, or whatever. <laughs> you know, you know, to be enriched by all the church and by all those kinds of experiences. And so we're being saved and we're being delivered. From what? From boredom. From sin. Yeah, from sin from illness, from misunderstanding, from a lack of, of understanding what it means to be a community of faith, a group of people whose being bound together is a mysterious thing. Uh, it's an act of God who giving a flip about one another makes a lot of difference. We had a guy this week that wrote us a little letter that's saying, nobody really cared about me when I came there. Um, he had some particular and specific needs, and, but it's, it breaks my heart because we tried to reach him, um, and we couldn't, we can't reach everybody, you know. But I want you to know that it is not small to miss anybody for the kingdom of God. Now, maybe somebody else will be able to be there for such people and all. But we need to be uh, about the Father's business, doing all that we can to. And then we can be enriched and informed. Did you notice that it said wisdom and knowledge is given to you? Uh, that's what Disciple Bible Study is about, those moments of God. Uh, enriched by each other's company. Uh, some of you are just nice to be around. Some of you uh, always say things that make you think. Uh, some of you have needs that make you pray. Uh, some of you have strengths that minister back again to us. I came in here yesterday. I was about to fall on my face. And I was thinking, God, God if you could just provide uh, just a little bit of assistance on this thing. And I go, and here's Mary, who's been working out at the Habitat house. And she's hot and sweaty. And she said, what are you going to do? What are you doing? I said, I'm going to start cleaning up. I'll help you. You know, bless your heart, Mary. Um, I'm telling you, you don't have if you don't ask. But sometimes you get even when you don't ask. And you're being enriched by somebody else who's willing to say, hey, I'll take the broom. Um, I'll get the vacuum. Uh, I'll help in the kingdom of God services. In just a little while, uh, Jan and Leslie will be offering the sacrament of communion at the end of the service for those of you who want to receive it. I'm sorry I wasn't here last week, but you all had a great service, I understand. But uh, they'll be back there offering the service of communion. You know what happens? You know, you can say, well, I think I'll take a moment and receive communion. You stop and you take the little bread that Nancy has cut. Incidentally, Nancy's got some more surgery coming up. We don't know if she's going to be able to keep that toe or not. Um, she cuts that bread for us every week. Why? Week after week do we pay her? No. Why she cut the bread? Because she loves God and she loves us. And touch the bread to the little cup which somebody else gave us. To the little juice that was made somewhere else. Um, in that sacramental moment, and all of a sudden you're doing that, you touch a little bread, a little cup, and God is there. Hmm? See? And so we're enriched, and so we grow. And each one of us can, in our own way, be little arcs, if you want, A-R-K-S. I thought I'd better spell that. Uh, you know, when the ark of the covenant of God was restored, David rejoiced. But you know what? Jesus on the cross rejoiced and celebrated crucified, forlorn, ignored, which maybe is the greatest crucifixion of all, left with only a few of his most beloved people there. And Jesus said, into your hands, God, I commend my spirit. If that's not celebration anyway, I don't know what is. One of our very beloved young ladies on the way out this morning was saying she had to fly tomorrow to San Francisco. And she was literally shaking. She said, planes just scare me so very much. And here's what went through my head. Say with me, I'm almost done. You all are real sweet. You're precious. I love to look at you. Um, do I dare tell her this? I mean, it's going to sound so um, preachery. And uh, what, what do you say? And so I said, no, I'm going to say it to her. I said, honey, here's what I do. I said, planes scare me too. Don't give me all this stuff about how much safer they are than cars. I don't pray as much in my car as I do on the plane. But anyway... <laughs> I said to her, every time when they get on the runway and the engines begin to rev and you begin ready for takeoff, I say this little prayer, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And I thought, gee, that sounds preacher, you know. But you know what happened to that? She absolutely stopped shaking. And her eyes got a little wide and she said, that will do very well. 
Thank you a lot. See? Gifts to give. Celebrations to continue. I close. Um, read an interesting story just this morning, and I don't think it fits at all, but I want to use it to close. <laughs> so you can make it fit under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Um, Fred Craddock said, this is that guy that taught preachers at Emory for a long time. He's retired now. That his mom had died, and they were having a little wake, a little prayer time visitation, we call it these days. And uh, some people came by from the church and the family, and everybody was real sweet. And some little lady came by they didn't know. She wasn't a member of the church, she wasn't a member of the family, but she was very religious. And she reminded them very quickly that if they were sad at all, that they weren't very religious. Because, she said, if you are truly understanding the gospel of Jesus, and you can kind of imagine the way this was put, then you would know this is the greatest day in the world for Mama. There's nothing to be sad about, nothing to be heartbroken about. Just rejoice in the Lord, no matter what. And she said, now, isn't one of you a preacher? And Fred <laughs> held his hand up. He said, because she was going to find me anyway. That's what he said. And she said, well, tell him. You ought to be the one. You ought to be the one that understands it better than anybody else. Just tell him about what a day of rejoicing this should be and that there shouldn't be a hint of anything that's sad or tearful. And he said, I wish Mom was here to make some biscuits. That's what I wish. And he said, I want to tell you something else, too. He said, I've come to the place in my life when I can say, God bless you, and I appreciate the fact that you want to be helpful. But I want to tell you something else. Not you or anybody else is going to make me feel guilty in this moment of grief. I'm just not going to do it. Thank you. Wouldn't it be nice if you could celebrate life to the full so that in life and in death you knew exactly what was sung to us? God does abide with and for us. Blessed be the name of God. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, it's a good thing to be at worship, but it's a holy thing. And it truly is a celebration that runs to the deepest levels of our understanding and then beyond. And sometimes it calls us to new places and new experiences. And sometimes it calls us to a brand new life simply because you're the God who is actively continuing to call forth the celebration. Help us to receive our share with joy and to celebrate, truly celebrate our living. And when our time to die has come, then perhaps we'll learn how to celebrate in ways we never dared to dream or think. In Jesus' name, amen.